Okay, now that wasn't everything that we saw at CES, so we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into, I mean, it's hard to pick the best of the best, but we picked three of our favorites from CES. Now, one of the things that we saw a lot of, we saw so many different gadgets, it's hard to keep track, but healthcare is one of the big places where the, it's, I would say, kind of the consumerization of healthcare. Um, not only for fitness, but even for wellness and um, being treated by doctors, sending them information. I have with me Jeff Holove. He is the CEO of a company called Basis, and they make a watch that's kind of special. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. My pleasure. Good Great. So are you, you're wearing the watch right now, I right? I am. This is the Basis band. And, so. and what's special about this watch? I mean, it tells time. That's great. It does tell As time. the kids would say, yes. so what? Yeah, it also tells the date. Wow, uh, but, multi, multi-function, multi-platform. Uh, this is uh, sort of part of this uh, connected health trend that you, you talked about. And at CES, this is certainly the biggest year for connected health so far. And in talking to the show organizers, it sounds like they're already planning for next year to be even bigger. Um, and I think that's a, a combination of a number of things. Clearly, um, what's going on um, politically right now, there's a lot of focus on trying to do something to improve health care. Our take on that Are is... Are you referring to the Republican or the Democratic candidates? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we all have our own efforts that were uh, okay. our own ideas, right? So uh, our take on that is um, a lot of this has to do with consumer empowerment around your own health, Give, giving us more perspective on where we are versus where we should be and some easy tools to get better, uh, to live better. So our tool is the basis band. Inside of here are five sensors. Show the, show the audience sure. here. I'll, I'll I mean, take it off and I'll actually uh, I'll show too. you the I mean, back of the device here. You can see the, uh, the sensors that I'm going to be talking about. So there's five sensors running all the time. There is uh, what's called an accelerometer, which is common in devices today. That measures motion, which fundamentally is about measuring how active you are. Uh, we not, also, where, not whether I've fallen down, but how active. It can also be used for that, but okay. typically in, in this space it's used to see how active you are, okay. right? How many steps are you walking, those kinds of things. Um, in our case, we add on top of that uh, something called galvanic skin response, which measures perspiration, which helps us measure how intense those activities that you're engaged in are. Uh, on top of that, we add two temperature sensors, one to measure skin temperature and one to measure ambient temperature, and we can correlate those. Uh, but really the big breakthrough here is without using a chest strap, we can see heart rate. Uh, so we can we believe that the heart is a kind of fundamental indicator of your overall wellness. You can understand lots and lots about your health by understanding what's going on with your heart. So we have here an optical engine that is shining light into the skin and measuring the reflection of that light back into the device, into the optical center. And by doing that, we can actually see your blood flow through your capillaries, and that's how we get a heart rate. Now, some, some products that do that can actually detect the level of oxygen in your blood, too, right? Do, do, do you go that far? Well, pulse ox is, a, is very much a known science. When you go to the hospital or you go to the doctor's office and they put that little thing on your, on your fingertip to measure pulse, yeah. uh, that's, that's pulse ox. Uh, conceptually, our approach to measuring heart rate is very, very similar. Uh, we're not literally measuring oxygen in the blood, but that technology of using light to see that blood flow is, is very similar. Now, one of the things that's interesting, there, there are different products that do some of those things. Yes. And doing all of it in one device sounds good, but there's more to it than that, isn't there? I mean, it's, it's kind of the combination of those factors that give you a picture of, of health and wellness. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think there's two really important things that we're doing here besides just more sensors running throughout uh, more of your day. I think um, part of it is really having a sort of multi-dimensional view of the day, right? Not just measuring how active you are, measuring these, these other things. Um, and I think the reason that that's important besides covering more of the day is it lets us understand not just what you're asking your body to do, not just how many steps you're walking, not just the activity, but how your body is responding to those activities, right? By seeing vital signs like the heart rate, we can see how your body is responding to 5,000 steps versus how my body or somebody else's body responds to 5,000 steps. But if, you, if, steps. if your heart rate's gone up, but you're not doing anything, you're not perspiring, you're not taking a right. lot of steps, that could be an indication of something uh, else going wrong. Exactly. Or, or similarly, your temperature going up could be because you're in a hot room versus the, versus the activity that you're engaged in. Or your uh, accelerometer may look very, very still, which to some devices might look like sleep, but to us may not look like sleep. So exactly the point. It's the ability to correlate the data coming from all of these sensors that gives us a much richer picture of what's actually going on. Okay, so let's look at the picture. We're going to take a look at what, what we have here on, on the monitor here. And um, so all this data gets from the watch up into the cloud. Up, up into the cloud, right? Okay. So it's a connected device. The watch collects data automatically, passively. You just wear the device. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to put it in special modes for it to identify special uh, kinds of activities. Um, and then when it connects to the cloud, all that data goes to the cloud. It runs through our fancy algorithms, and we get to uh, spot trends. We get to uh, identify the patterns. 
um, and render all of that data. And we believe very, very strongly that lots and lots of data is, of course, not the same as lots of information. So our job is to take all these data coming from you know, sensors that people have never heard of before, like galvanic skin response, and turn it into something that regular folks understand. So it kind of, there's an algorithm that crunches the data, gives you this, now this is your profile here. Right, so this is my, uh, my profile, at least up until the part of the day when I walked over here. So what you can see here at the top of our dashboard um, is we're boiling all of these, this data down into uh, very simple metrics. In this case, you can see how many calories I'm burning, and beneath that, well, I thought here, that's how many calories you ate today. No, that's oh, how many I'm wow. burning. That's 2206 for that's, those in the live audience. Uh, that's activity. Um, and you can see that I'm not quite at my goal yet. The small number underneath my calories is how many calories for my uh, height, weight, age, etc. I see. I so it's not just showing what you've done, but kind of relative right. to where you In the need context to be. of what you should be doing, right, or, or where you should be. Same with steps. Uh, and then sleep, you can see last night was a good night of sleep for me. And then to the right, you can see a kind of, you know, an, an aggregating of how good of a day am I having. And then you can see that over time. So I'm earning points for doing the things that are good for me. Uh, and then beneath this, the, the, the scoreboard, if you like, beneath the dashboard, you can see the system automatically identifying events. You can see here it's identified 16 minutes where I was probably uh, walking. You see a, a lunch uh, walk uh, in the middle of the day. You see beneath that it capturing automatically the sleep that I had last night. So the system is automatically finding these patterns and reporting them to me. And one of the big insights that comes out of that is just more awareness, right? The system automatically making you aware of the things that are going on in your life, giving you that, that sort of consciousness about those um, and, and making those choices more conscious for you. And then secondly, it's giving you the positive reinforcement. It's identifying the things that are good for you and rewarding you with points for doing the things that are good for you. So this is yesterday, right. you'd, so it looks like you, you kind of met your goals in all of these Yeah, I areas. didn't get quite as much sleep uh, yesterday, which is often the case in a, in a startup, but you can see uh, yesterday looks like I managed to make it out for a run, lots of steps there, which helps me burn uh, more calories. So the goal here is to earn 100 points for the day. That's a day that I've lived, lived well. It doesn't mean that I've lived perfectly. It doesn't mean that I haven't made some non-best choices, but it's a day that I've lived pretty well, and yesterday you can see I beat that goal. Okay, so finally, just to wrap up here, we've got a lot of data here. Um, I imagine you can export this data, maybe even uh, feed it into, there are a lot of other products out there, some collaboration with those products. Is there any of that in the works? Yeah, we haven't announced uh, any specific plans around how this data will be shareable, but certainly in this space, it is very much common practice and we believe good practice that these systems be open and that the data be exportable to the kinds of uh, either other uh, kinds of applications or other uh, usage of the data that you'd want. And after all, it's your data. You ought to be able to export it and see it the way you like. And you can get this now for how much? We haven't launched it yet. Oh. What we've said is, uh, is first half of 2012, and it'll be $199. And you can get it where? Uh, you can't get it yet. Well, when You'll, you can. You will be able to get it. You'll get it from, from us at MyBasis.com. I'm going to take yours, so I can get it right now. <laughs> uh, MyBasis.com is where you can find it. Great. Jeff, thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, we're going to join David Berlin. He's actually gone uh, traveling out. He's an adventurous guy. He went out <laughs> into our live studio audience. Well, he's going to show us the next product from CES. David? Hey, thanks, Fritz. And as, of course, you said, we've got the live studio audience behind us. And uh, one of the uh, categories that was really hot at this year's CES were Ultrabooks. These are really small notebook computers that pack all the power that the bigger ones from about four or five years ago used to have. And one of the ones we came across was this Ultrabook from HP. It's called the Scepter, uh, the Spectre. It's the 14-inch version of it. Actually, the screen is 14 inches, but the chassis is 13 inches. And I'm just going to read through some of the, uh, the characteristics here, the, 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 some of the properties of this. It's got a uh, 1600 by 900 resolution on the screen, so very high resolution. Although in this, in this big of, uh, in, in this small of a display, sometimes at those high resolutions, characters can be quite small, people who have weak eyes, but it will be very brilliantly displayed. It's got Gorilla Glass all over it, not only on the display the way iPhones have, but also on the palm rest. And that would come in handy, let's say, if uh, you were um, wearing watches or jewelry and you tend to scratch the surface of your notebook, well, this will protect the, the, the surface of the notebook. Uh, HP claims that this can last, the battery in this, about nine hours. So if you do any sort of coast-to-coast -coast flying or even some international flying, this will probably last for the entire flight if it lives up to expectations. Um, it's got a, a whole bunch of ports on the side here. Uh, one of the most notable ones is the uh, gigabit, gigabit Ethernet port. It's also got a display port, so if you want to hook it up to a chain of displays, and, uh, and have lots of displays connected to this when you're sitting at home, you can use that. Weighs under four pounds and uh, also supports USB 3.0. And uh, finally, it also has uh, what's called Beats Audio. Now, this is an audio technology that you've seen show up in some of the smartphones. It supposedly improves 
to a great extent, the quality of the audio that you're hearing when you're using the, uh, the port on the outside. There's actually a thumb wheel here to change the volume on that. HTC has that in their smartphones. Now, one of the things you can look at is the difference between the, uh, the HP Ultrabook and a MacBook Air, and you can kind of see where they got their inspiration from on the keyboard. The keyboards are almost identical. One of the main differences, though, on this, the, uh, the Spectre is that it has each key is illuminated by its own LED light. So um, I'm going to take a break here for one second and ask Andrea Ragney to step over. So Andrea, um, I've just described to you this notebook computer. You've heard about it. Now, before we uh, continue, um, do you have anything to do with HP? I do not, no. And uh, have we had a conversation before? Uh, <laughs> we have not. We, you have not, no conversation. No. You just sort of, uh, I just I answered pulled, the I audience. Up here. In fact, when I grabbed your hand, you resisted. Absolutely. That's all right. But your friend sitting next to you said, go, go. So, 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 Here I am. So you're not a paid shill of any sort. No. Um, can I ask you, what kind of notebook computer you use right now? Um, well, I have a personal Mac computer. I have a MacBook. Um, at work, I use a Dell, and I also use an iPad as well. So you're using a Dell at work. Mm -hmm. And that's not running the Mac OS operating system, nope. is it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're using a MacBook for work For my, my own personal and, use. Oh, so you're, you're kind of a I hybrid person, right? So, right. so you're, you, you would be willing, you're, you're, you're on the fence, you'd be willing to work with Windows, because you already work with it. Would right. you be willing to work with it at home, or do you really um, like your Mac? I'm personal to my Mac. You're um, personal to your Mac. I like the design aspects of it and things like that. They so. won't buy you a Mac at work? Mm, not right now, maybe. Oh, all right. I wish. All right, well, let me know who they are. I'll send them an email oh, on your behalf. You've just heard a whole bunch about this really cool uh, Ultrabook from HP. Mm -hmm. um, if you were allowed to get a notebook computer at work, based on what you just heard, is this something that would interest you, or are you looking for other stuff in your notebook? Um, you know, what's cool about this, I thought, was when you talked about the pad where you rest your hands, I always wear watches and bracelets, and the fact that it mm -hmm. wouldn't scratch is really something that's great. Mm -hmm. And then also, if the battery life, like you said, like. Um, totally lives up to its expectations. I think that would be great as well when you're on a flight and things like that. The worst thing that can happen to you is you run out of batteries. Unless, so. of course, you're in one of those new jets True. that has power yes. on them, which is... But sometimes those don't work. Right. So, you're, so, so how long does your MacBook usually last you? Um, you know, that's a good question. Maybe five to six hours? Yeah, mine only lasts... I have a MacBook Pro, 17-inch, you right. know, sucks a lot of juice and mm. only lasts about two and a half hours. So then it's time to get the iPad out and watch yep. a movie when I'm on a flight, right? Definitely. All right, well, Andrew, thanks very You're much. You're welcome. All right, so um, there you go. That's the uh, HP Ultrabook, the Spectre. Uh, the spec it's called the Envy Spectre. If you get it, maybe you'll be the envy of all your friends, maybe not. Uh, meanwhile, we've got more products to look at. Fritz is back at the table. He's going to be talking about a company called uh, Lytro. They were, in addition to the basis armband, one of the competitors in CES's last gadget standing competition and they were the winner. So, Fritz, let's well, talk David, about Well, David, you know, I'm going to join you out there. It doesn't look like you're getting too lonely, but I don't want you to be alone uh, out there. So in a minute, I'll join you. But I've been looking forward to this for a while as well. And you were a judge for uh, last ga gadget standing. Lytro has been kind of the buzz of the industry for the past few months. They make a camera. Well, it's not just a camera. It's, I think, designed to kind of change the way the digital photography happens. And I have Kira Wampley, Wampler, I'm sorry, I butchered your name already, who is the Vice President of Marketing with Lytro, and she's going to show us how it works. But before we show how it works, um, hold it up there for people to see. I mean, it doesn't even look like a camera. It looks like a toy of some sort. But um, what, what's so spectacular about this camera? Sure. Well, this is the world's first consumer light field camera. And so what that means is that this camera captures the entire light field which is the direction of light. No conventional camera does that today. And you might want to know, like, why would you care? Why would you care? Why would you care? I'll ask that the question. Why would say, you care? Why would you care? And the reason why you care is that when you capture that direction of light and you get that missing information that conventional cameras don't capture, you can do things with your pictures that you can't do with traditional pictures. The biggest and most interesting one is focusing a picture after the fact. So you shoot, take a picture, and then you change the focus after the fact. So that means there's no shutter delay, we turn the camera on instantly, and then you have a lot of creative control uh, with the picture because you can tell some stories uh, with the depth. So you're trying to tell me that these big fancy cameras that cost thousands and thousands of dollars with all these sensors and everything in it can't do what that 
that's going to cost four hundred dollars, three ninety nine, right? The the opening model is three ninety nine. Yes. So that can do more in terms of capturing the entire light field than those cameras. There's no con consumer camera today that captures the light field. And actually, I'll spend a half a second talking about the history. It used to require a room full of cameras tethered to a supercomputer, precisely timed to capture the light field. And what our CEO and founder, Ren Ung, did is that he miniaturized the room full of cameras into the light field sensor on this camera, which is right about here. And then he miniaturized the light field engine so that we can process all of that data directly on the camera. Wow. Um, and so the, the results are pretty stunning. Um, I, I think let's, let's jump into how it works. Sure. It's pretty simple. I don't see any buttons on it. Um, so how, how do you take a picture? Sure. Well, it's pretty simple. There's a shutter button right there. There it is, yeah. And I click it on, just turns itself on. There's, so we get a little viewfinder there. Is, there's a viewfinder, the there's a zoom. It's so not a, the, really you're an just, interesting You're picture. just kind of touching it with your finger there yep. and it's zooming in. There's a zoom slider right on the top. There's a on-off button here and then the USB uh, right there. And then the shutter button here. I actually took some pictures of the crowd earlier. Uh, there, there you guys are. <laughs> There's some folks from the crowd. Unbeknownst to us. Unbeknownst to you, you are already shot in the light field. So wait, go back just for one second there. Sure. So you, so you can see multiple pictures in there. This is the three by three grid, so I'm looking at all the pictures. Okay. And then I just uh, went back to one of my favorites. This is uh, on the beach in Half Moon Bay a couple of weeks ago. And I can zoom in, I can focus on my daughter. So your daughter was blurry just a second ago. Right. You tapped on her and she and she's went in now, focus. Now she's in focus. And then I can find this cute little pug, and I can click on the pug and bring the pug in focus. All right, so can you do, can you delete and, do, you know, I don't sure. see any menus. Okay, so So I swipe go. up, I can delete, I can check the, uh, the, the storage, I can check the battery. The other thing that we can do is I can star this picture if it's my favorite. And because we offer an entire end-to-end -end system, desktop, web, mobile, uh, when you star this picture, what that means is the starred pictures will be the first ones that come into your computer and start processing. Now, uh, at CES, I talked to your director of photography. He said there's a new little feature mm -hmm. coming on where you can actually change the center of focus. Right. Can you show us that? Sure. So, uh, in uh, Live View, oops, in Live View, I can swipe up. I there's can, a little flower icon. A little there. flower icon, though. Don't stay too wetted to that. Uh, and then when I um, go back into preview or into live view mode, then what I can do is, let's see, do you have a ring on? I don't. Okay, uh, let's. How about a, how okay. a Band-Aid? Oh, let's do a Band-Aid because that'll be really sexy. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to focus around your Band-Aid and I'm going to take the picture and then when I swipe, now, I, if you noticed, uh, I'm, it might have been hard to see on the screen, but I was literally, the lens was nearly touching your finger. Right, very, very close. Very close. And you can even zoom in on that. So now I'm getting the fine detail of, um, of your Band-Aid. It's a little bit of a cooler shot if you have a ring on. Um, the fine detail of your Band-Aid, and then I can control in really extreme macro this creative potential with the focus. So it's kind of creating a depth of field that it, it takes, you know, I mean, you guys have given this to professional photographers. What, what, what are they doing with this? Yeah, you know what? We're hearing from professionals as well as from people who love photography that they're thinking about photography in a new way. They're thinking about telling stories in a multi-dimensional way. They're thinking about that moment of discovery. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking at a, at a scene and there's a flower in the front, and then there's just something a little bit beyond the flower that you might want to click on. And when you do, you see a girl in the background. That's a real. That's one of our famous shots right now on Lightro.com. Well, so that storytelling is something that the pros are really loving. Well, we've got here on screen a um, the Lightro uh, a site, and there's a there's a lot of great pictures there. If you want to go to Lightro.com, this one has a, a little squirrel. Yeah. So this is you know I've, I've uploaded my photos, and if I if I click on that. Yeah. Squirrel, he comes into, or she, I don't know what. I don't know. Either. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it comes into focus, and those leaves go back out of focus, and right. vice versa. Right. So it, it kind of gives the photographer a lot of flexibility and ability to kind of play mm -hmm. around with um, what kind of effect, almost different pictures mm -hmm. for whatever it is that you want. And now, different is, stories within a picture. I mean, that's one. Of, that's one of the yeah. things that we're hearing from the pros in particular is that. They love the fact that they can tell different stories within a picture and they can invite the viewer 
to interact with that picture. Now, on the other hand, someone like me, you know, the, I, I like to refer to myself as some, the, the family archivist. You know, with the picture of my daughter, I was just out at the beach, we were having fun, I picked up the camera, clicked the shutter, and I was able to focus the picture after the fact and get a great picture. So we're really seeing these sort of two industry, interesting groups of people taking pictures with the camera. So a few quick questions. It sure. stores this in a proprietary format for now, Correct. not readable by Adobe, Photoshop, and all that, but that will change, one thinks? Sure, one absolutely. I mean, we, we believe that Lightfield is the next um, wave of photography, so from film to digital and digital to Lightfield. And of course, we want the Lightfield file to be something that's um, natively adopted in as many uh, tools as possible. How, much, how many pictures can that hold? So we have two models. We have a graphite and an electric blue that are 8 gig, and they hold 350 Lightfield pictures. The red hot that I'm holding is 16 gig, and it holds 750 pictures. And Three ninety nine for the eight gig, and four ninety nine for the red hot, the sixteen gig. The red hot and available when you can pre order it now, right? You can pre order it now. We started taking pre orders on Lytro com, and we start shipping our first orders in a little bit. We're very excited. All right, well, get your order in now because I want to place a pre order, and it's April or May before I can get mine. So, yeah. um, thank you so much. This is a very exciting new product. But that's not all from CES. We've actually got a couple of products that we. I want to say pilfered from the show floor that we're actually going to give away here in a second. David, I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah, hey, thanks, Fritz. Yeah, this is sort of like a midnight requisition. We we found some products on the show floor. We actually brought them back, and we're going to be giving them away to our online audience uh, just in a few moments here. And I'm going to go over some of those products and what some of the characteristics are of them. One of the products that we found uh, was this backpack. Now, this is not your ordinary backpack. This is a, from a company called Power Bag. And what makes this different? You've seen, you may have seen some of these bags that are on the market right now that will power your devices through a solar panel. This is not that bag. What this bag is, is it's a bag that you can put your devices in. It's pre-wired, so it's got connections for different USB configurations, micro USB, mini USB. It's even got a 30-pin connector. And when you put your devices in this bag, then you take uh, a power adapter, like a little power brick, and you plug it in to this port right here. And what that does is it charges a battery that's inside the bag. This particular bag has a 1900 milliamp battery in it. And that battery will store your charge. And if you're somebody who's got, let's say, an iPhone 4, which can hardly make it through the day on one single battery charge, then what you do is you put it inside this bag, and you hook it up, and then you press this button that's on the front here for a couple seconds. And what it'll start to do is you'll see a light going up. I don't know if you can see it on the camera because we have a lot of lights here in the studio. And that will recharge your iPhone. Now, the company says under a 1900 milliamp uh, battery that's in here, there's different size batteries you can put in here. It's very modular that you can uh, charge an iPhone, let's say, up to four times off of that one charge. You can charge other devices, too. You can put iPads in there. You can put other smartphones in there, USB-based devices. Very cool. I've been playing around with it. I actually had a bunch of devices in here. I just sat it down next to a plug in the wall and plugged the whole bag in. And if you're just sitting there with the devices plugged into these wires and the bag plugged in, you'll just charge the devices as you go. You don't have to worry about depleting any of the charge that's in the battery. One of the, uh, the other characteristics of the bag is, is that um, when you take this through an airport where you store your notebook, it'll flop open. There's a bunch of stuff falling out right now. And what this does is you slide it through the uh, security, through the x-ray machine like this, and you leave your notebook in this side. Now, the notebook slides into a pocket that's in the back there. It's a padded, uh, padded area, but it doesn't hold a very big notebook, like a 17-inch notebook, so it's limited on size. And again, the bag, not very cavernous. I actually used this bag at CES to see if it would get me around a little bit. One last thing, if you have some sort of device that has some sort of proprietary charging cable, there is one USB port on the battery inside the bag that you can connect to that. So that's the power bag, and we're going to be giving that away to one of our lucky, uh, lucky audience viewers. And then, Fritz, you're standing here next to me, and you've got a funky pair of headphones on your head. Yeah, these yeah. are yours, actually. They are mine, that's correct. And, uh, these are the headphones from a company called Voxlink. We found these on the show floor. And what's special about these is if you can focus in on that, you'll notice that you turn your head this way, though, so they can see is that the, there is no ear cup or in-ear earbud on these. 
Okay, so if you're used to something like a Bluetooth headset that goes into your ear and there's no microphone, but somehow it's picking up your sound, the way it's picking up that sound is through your jawbone. It's called bone conduction technology. Your bones actually carry a lot of sound. Well, this is the same thing, but in the other direction. So what happens is the sound comes through, it comes into these pads that are sitting on your temples here, and then you'll hear the music or whatever the audio is that you're listening to with no trouble. It gets transmitted directly to your inner ear through your bones. Now, why would you use something like this? Well, the reason you'd use this is, let's say you're driving and you want to use your phone in a hands-free way, but you don't want to use one of the earbuds, let's say it came with your iPhone, that blocks other sounds that are in the environment around you that you might need to hear. For example, a horn honking or someone screaming. Same thing with running. A lot of runners have been injured crossing streets by, by cars. If they can't hear the car coming, the likelihood of injury is a lot higher. This allows you to hear your music or whatever it is you're listening to and everything that's going on around you at the same time. Well, I've been listening to Justin Bieber this entire time. Yeah, I talk. won't question your judgment on music. So uh, uh, is that between Barry Manilow and Neil Sedaka? Is and Air Supply, yeah, actually. Okay, thank you. But, uh, well, there's some other this kind of where these came from applications. That's that right. The origins of the technology date back to military applications. So you can imagine, let's say you're a soldier in the field, Fritz, and you're, you, need, you need to hear the commands coming from your commanding officer, but you also need to, hear, you need to hear the enemy who's in the bushes rustling behind you. So this is the sort of technology that they use in the field. Now, it comes in two different versions. One version is the version that has built-in microphones, so you can use it with your iPhone and it could become a hands-free phone set. And another version, lesser expensive version, is one that works with just any other uh, MP3 player or iPod. And so we'll be giving away the version that works with phones. And Not so, yours. I mean, I, one other advantage is I didn't have to get your earwax. That's right, if you're sharing here. Yeah, uh, it's funny that you bring that up. Not the earwax bit, but there's one other advantage that I thought I, that they didn't advertise that I thought was interesting. Uh, if you have kids, and they're always putting headphones on, they're playing the music very loudly through their headphones, you can't really hear how loud it is. Right? With these, they can play it loudly, but it won't have direct access to your inner ear and your eardrums where it could do some damage. Now, I'm not a doctor, I haven't done any studies on this, but I immediately saw this and I said, these are the headphones I want to put on my kids' heads, not the ones that I, where I can't hear what's going on and whether they're causing damage to their ears. Great, so we're going to be giving away to one online viewer, mm -hmm. uh, the backpack and these headphones, not these particular ones, and then for, for another viewer, we're going to have this uh, beautiful Amazon Kindle Fire. Now, uh, I probably don't have to explain what this is, uh, the latest in Android tablets, and probably the only tablet of any sort that's given Apple a little bit of run for its money in the iPad. Just a bit of a challenger. I mean, Apple released its results today, right, and they broke all records. Like SAP, it was their it was their best year ever, best quarter ever. Uh, iPhone 4S obviously propelling it to new heights. I don't know if you saw the numbers. They have $97.6 billion of cash in the bank. That's enough to buy half of Google. And also $100 million has been spent going after Samsung. 